All right. Good evening, everyone. It looks like we are live for our very first daily wrap up. So I want to welcome you to the daily wrap up and Q&A for Bama Bug Fest on the web for today, uh, July 7th. And today's uh, bug theme is what makes a bug a bug. We've been collecting all of your questions and comments about our content throughout the day, and we'll be asking our panel of experts to help us answer as many as we can. Uh, these daily wrap ups happen every day um, that we promote or that we have content for the Bama Bug Fest, and they happen live at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. We are joined this evening by Sadie Zabawa, who is the Youth Services um, Librarian at the Weaver Bolden Branch for the Tuscaloosa Public Library. Hey, Sadie. Hey. And we're joined by um, Dr. John Friel, the director of the Alabama Museum of Natural History. You hey, might everybody. recognize them. <laughs> you might recognize them from programs we've had throughout the day. And they've been kind enough to agree to come back this evening for a quick Q&A session. So thank you all for joining us and thank you for helping with the event today. How did it all go today? It was so fun. <laughs> yeah, it really was. Good. I'm glad. I'm glad. Um, so yeah, if you you know were able to, to log into any of the uh, videos that we had today, both of these faces, actually all three of these, I was there too, all three of these faces are probably pretty familiar to you. But um, so throughout the day, we've been looking at the comment section of the, all of the platforms, which there are many platforms that we are posting all this content to. And um, have been collecting uh, some of the questions that you have. So please know that this is an option, an opportunity for you to, you know, if you've got questions throughout the day, post them in the comments and we will check them every day and put them here at the uh, daily wrap up. But we are also taking comments live and questions live. So if, as you're watching this daily wrap up, if you have any questions about what we're talking about, please feel free to put them in the comments and we will post them up so our um, experts can talk about them and answer them for us. But um, so I think let's just get started. What do you guys think? Yeah. So the first couple of questions I have are for Sadie. Um, I loved that book. That yeah. book was great. The um, illustrations. Oh, there it is. Yeah. Some bugs. I'm also very impressed that you were able to say the um, author's name because I had trouble with it. Um, I feel real. I'm sorry, author. I had a difficulty with that the last time. But um I am, uh, it was such a beautiful, let me see if I can get you some more. There you go. So we can see your book a little bit better. Yeah. So um, if you, you know, that video of Sadie reading this book is live uh, or is, is up rather in lots of different places. You can find out on uh, BamaBugFest.org where you can view all of those. Um, so you can see that video again. But what, um, what brought you to this book, Sadie? What made you decide to choose this book for Bama Bug Fest to get us started? Yeah, um, I was definitely drawn to, to the illustrations. They're really beautiful and eye-popping. Um, there aren't a lot of words. The illustrations speak for themselves. And if you look closely, we've got this ladybug friend here. And it is in every single picture on every page throughout the book. So if you go and look through it again, you will see our ladybug friend. And also at the end, we've got all this great back matter that names all the bugs that are in the books. You can go back through and see their official names. So if you wanna learn more about these bugs, you can look them up. You know what, I bet we're gonna be covering some of those bugs or at least the broader like grouping of those bugs during bug fest. This, yeah, so this is perfect. It was the perfect start off to our Bama mm -hmm. bug fest. Um, so I think you're right. I mean, those the illustrations are beautiful. There's this page in there that's the um, ant pit, well, it's an ant picnic. The picnic wasn't necessarily made for the ants, but the ants definitely took advantage of location. There it is. Look at that. <laughs> that is a summer picnic I would like to have in my life. Those ants knew what was up and they got the right things. So um, so if people are wanting to check out and try to find the ladybug friend all over the pages, how can they uh, get to this book? What's a good way for them to be able to find this book? It is at the library. Our main branch is open right now, Tuesday through Saturday from 10 to four. And you can go right in and grab this book off the shelf or you can schedule a curbside appointment and we will get it off the shelf for you and give it to you so that you never even have to leave your car and have a contactless appointment to get your bug books. 
that's pretty cool. And I know that there are, this one is a great one. And I know that the library is just full of other bug, bug and insect related books that people can find. Am I right? Are there a lot yeah. there? The bug books are crawling off the shelf. There are so many of them. And we have them in our picture book section. We have them in our nonfiction section for kids and adults. Um, there's plenty of bug books. You can look um, in the library. You can ask a librarian. They can show you where they are. And we also have um, some links to our bug books in our handy resource guide. Um, if you want to look there for some more books about insects. Excellent. Yes. And that resource guide, once again, can be found at our website, BamaBugFest.org. Um, the resource guide was lovingly put together by a friend of ours and one of the Bama Bug Fest uh, event committee uh, members named Lance, who works at the UA libraries at the Rogers Library. And it is wonderful. So he's added a lot of great links to other books that you can check out, um, as well as a bunch of other links that are on there, too. So Thank you so much for sharing. Oh, wait, actually, you know what? I have I have a surprise for you, Sadie. Ooh. <gasps> wow. Oh my gosh, you built a bug. <laughs> I love it. And, oh my god. I named it Ingrid. Yeah, it's Ingrid <laughs> the insect. <laughs> and um, this is Sadie um, put together this wonderful build a bug workshop. And you can find um, the build a bug workshop on the bamabugfest.org. Um, but you can, it's this fully customizable insect creation lab workshop experience. And that is what happened. Ingrid, Ingrid happened from all of that. Uh, she's beautiful. It, <laughs> she maybe only has four legs because I didn't count right, but she is supposed to have six legs, but it's my bug. So she has four legs. <laughs> um, I'm also just going to say that some of the two of the legs are hidden underneath the wings. That's acceptable, right? I think. <laughs> but um, but yeah, can you? Um, I know I'm kind of putting you on the spot, so I'm sorry. But can you talk a little bit about like putting together that build a bug workshop? I I mean, it seems yeah. kind of neat. Yes. Um, so I looked at actual pictures of actual bug parts and got some ideas from them for some of the cool stuff I wanted to include in the workshop. And I was amazed at all the cool antenna out there. So many bugs have amazing antenna. <laughs> um, so <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> wild with your build a bug workshop and create anything that you want to. Um, it doesn't actually have to work because it is your own bug imagination. Yeah. I also will say that in that video, you make an excellent joke at the end, which I greatly appreciate where you talk about it being stuck to the page, but it's so realistic that it could just fly from the page. It was perfect. It was wonderful. Oh, Everyone <laughs> has to watch that video now just to get that little joke at the end. Um, well, and the rest of it too, obviously, but you got to stick around to the end so you can get that great joke. Um, but yeah, so I'm so glad. Thank you so much for making this. It's going to go on a notebook or a binder that I will have with me forever. I'm really excited about wonderful. it. Okay. Um, <laughs> so um, let's go ahead and so after that was that the I think yours was the two o'clock one wasn't it Sadie? Mm -hmm. Yes. So then we moved to our four o'clock one where uh, Dr. Friel and I talked about well huh, sorry Dr. Friel talked about I did not talk about any of them but Dr. Friel talked about what makes a bug a bug what is a bug and you had this great presentation that showed just how large a grouping and how diverse a grouping um, arthropods are. And that's what our general like big definition of bug is going to be. Is that right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, there's, you know, bug in a very technical term, it only applies to a really specific group of insects. But I think if you're not an entomologist or a scientist and you're just um, an average person, when someone says bug, um, you sometimes apply that to spiders, uh, crustaceans, all kinds of arthropods. So, you know, this is a public event. Um, we want to embrace uh, inclusiveness. So we basically want to recognize all arthropods because they all share common features. And, you know, we all have personal relationships with them. Um, a lot of them are, in fact, insects, but we have relationship with crustaceans, with spiders, with other arachnids, um, some fossil groups. So the idea is they're all connected somehow. And the easiest term for all of them, arthropods is kind of a technical term, um, kind of a little bit of a tongue twister, but everyone can say bugs. Um, they're used all the time when people refer to bugs. Um, 
but we're going to claim them, at least for our festival. When we say bugs, we basically mean arthropods. That's great. And, you know, we actually have um, a bug themed question that came into the comments. Can I show you real quick? So someone said that they found a toe pincher type of bug on campus and asked if they were natural here, if they were native to Alabama. Do you know anything about those? I'm not sure exactly what a toe pincher. I've heard of a toe biter. And those are actually um, aquatic uh, bugs that um, I mentioned true bugs. Uh, one of the characteristics I mentioned was that they have these piercing sucking mouth parts. And there are these rather large uh, aquatic predatory bugs that um, people call toe biters. So I'm not sure if that's what he's referring to by toe pincher. Um, the other thing possibility might be um, earwigs. Ingrid, you know, when I, when I saw your uh, build a bug, Ingrid the insect, um, those little pincers on her posterior are very typical of a group of insects we call earwigs. Um, so that's the other possibility. So without seeing a picture, um, I'm not sure exactly what type of bug, but the reality is there are lots of bugs on campus. Um, you know, I've, I'm always documenting the different insects we find um, and I wouldn't be surprised. There are probably thousands of different insects that are on the UA campus, uh, even more across the Tuscaloosa area. Um, so when you start looking into it, they're everywhere and there's a lot of them and a lot of different kinds. Bugs, bugs everywhere. <laughs> yeah. um, so in the presentation that you gave, I think one of the, I mean, it was, it was fascinating, but one of the ones that I think I wanted to ask you and revisit a little bit was the difference between a centipede and a millipede. And you, you talked a little bit about sure. those. And I think it's one that, you know, we see those often. They're definitely here in Alabama, but um, yep. some the words interchangeably and they they're kind of they're different yeah they're they're different but they're related so i understand why people get them confused because compared to other arthropods they're rather long and leggy that's something they have in common um, but if you look at the details in the legs uh, for example millipedes the name implies they have thousands of legs which is a little bit of an exaggeration some of them have a hundred or more um, I don't think there's any that actually get up to four digits in limbs, but they have more, generally more legs than centipedes. Um, and then centipedes means hundred legs. So again, kind of over exaggerating again, they don't have, uh, most of them don't have anywhere near that many legs, but they have a lot of legs, you know, compared to uh, most insects having six, spiders having eight, you know, when you have like, several dozen, 50 more, a lot of legs. And both millipedes and centipedes can have those. But the difference is that millipedes have, if you look at the individual segments, so both millipedes and centipedes, if you look at them along their bodies, they're elongate, but there's these repeating segments uh, in between the front end and the back end. And on a millipede, there are two pairs of legs per segment. And on a centipede, there's just a single one. So that's, if you look, zoom in, um, but sometimes it's hard to count the legs. I mean, you have to kind of pick them up. So what I always tell people is they're very different. They're kind of on different ends of the kind of uh, continuum of what they feed on. So millipedes are kind of slow and steady. Um, they eat plant material, decaying matter. So they don't have to chase down prey items. So they're lots of legs, but they move slow. And then at the other end of the spectrum, we have the centipedes, which are like, you know, the big predators. They're super fast. Um, some of them run really fast and they have big uh, pincers on their head, on the front ends that they actually can grab prey with and inject venom into. So they're super aggressive um, and they're really fast. So if you see something in your house and you're not sure if it's a millipede or centipede, you don't have to stop and count legs. You probably couldn't do it because they're moving. Uh, but if just how quickly it's moving. And I think if I showed you a millipede, if you had a race between a millipede and a centipede, it's no contest. It's like the tortoise and the hare. Um, the but tortoise would be the one, millipede. Slow and steady won the race, though. Yeah, it does. And they both have, <laughs> they, you know, in some ways, actually, millipedes have better defenses. I mentioned in my talk that they have a lot of chemical defenses. So while they don't have venom, they produce some nasty chemicals if you try to eat them. Um, so that's the one thing. Some of them have like a cyanide type um, toxin, which smells like kind of apples or almonds. Others like will stain your skin. Um, we have some really large ones. I think if anyone that spent time out inside in Alabama, we have some species of millipedes here that get several inches long, up, up to over six inches long. So there are these giant North American millipedes. And um, 
you won't mistake them for anything else. They're slow moving. Um, and we also have some big centipedes. Our biggest centipedes get about three inches long, um, but there are much bigger ones that occur uh, out in the Southwest that get most a foot long. Oh my goodness. I'm glad <laughs> that we're where we are then. That's good to know. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so that's, I, I love that. That's great. And I think, um, I like how you, I, the way I see it is centipede or millipede is just a bunch of, it's like way too many socks to have to deal with. Okay. That wasn't as good of a joke as I wanted it to be. I had it different in my head. It didn't come out the same anyway. Um, so um, one more thing, and I don't, Sadie, this was the craziest thing that he said, but he was saying that I think it's really neat, but horseshoe crabs are actually in the arachnid grouping. Uh, right? I know. I agree. So they're in the arachnid grouping, which I think is really interesting. Um, do you have any more to talk up or say about that a little bit more, John? Yeah, just generally, I think, I think we've known for a long time that um, horseshoe crabs, which, you know, we often refer to as living fossils because at least the modern ones we have, they're four living species are to most people, if you look at them, they haven't changed much over hundreds of millions of years. So the earliest fossils of horseshoe crabs look virtually identical to modern ones. So they're one of these things which are often cited as a classic case of a living fossil because at least morphologically, they haven't evolved much over hundreds of millions of years. And they have, they almost look like trilobites, kind of an extinct group I mentioned. So they have a very distinctive, um, they're marine. Um, I mean, look, think about arachnids. Arachnids are spiders and scorpions and their relatives. Um, kind of really different looking. Most of them are terrestrial. Um, they seem to be really different. Um, but we always know they've had these kind of similar mouth parts, these chelicerae, which the, the larger group chelicerae is named for. But more recent studies, um, we live in a time now where people are doing um, more use of DNA looking sequence data, sometimes using entire genomes, much larger data sets. And it really has added support. And in the past couple of years, there have been a couple of studies in which people have looked at large numbers of genes and found very strong evidence that what we know as horseshoe crabs are in fact nested not only within chelicerae, which we suspected, but actually within arachnids and, and are much more closely related um, to the arachnids, which are the largest group of chelicerates. Um, so it's, it, you know, the morphology is a little misleading. And that happens sometimes. Uh, and, you know, there are other examples I could give you uh, both in and outside of insects where there's been some surprises. Another one is um, recently uh, similar studies have shown that, you know, termites, people know what termites are. People know what cockroaches are. They're closely related. And actually cockroaches are just kind of antisocial <laughs> um, termites. And they're actually, they're actually are, is one a small group of, uh, cockroaches, some of which we actually have in Alabama that eat wood, um, that aren't as destructive as termites. So there's all these really neat discoveries we're finding. Uh, and sometimes, you know, uh, the morphology has been right all along, but sometimes it's tricked us as we start using new uh, techniques, uh, more genetic data, we're finding some surprises in the big family tree for uh, arthropods. That's so cool. I had no idea. I mean, I never would have put cockroaches and termites at the same family gathering. No. Um, and apparently it's just a big spread of maybe like two by fours and branches and at least for some of them. Um, so we were able to get a couple more questions in on the live comments. The one oh, that I talked about the toe pincher said that it was like mm -hmm. the giant water bug. So I think it's the one that yep. you were first mentioning. That's what we're thinking of. Yep. And they're yeah. really neat. They, when you see one, they're kind of scary looking I mean, they get three or four inches long, really big ones. Um, they've got these big legs and, um, they normally feed on fishes and amphibians and other insects. Um, but if you like, we're, we're dipping that in or staining and maybe pick one up and weren't aware of it, um, they have this long needle-like proboscis that they stick into you. And while they, they don't have any venom, it's quite painful. It's like driving like a needle into your hand. So um, people have the experience sometimes where they're wading around in, in some aquatic vegetation and something bites their toe, hence the name toe biter. I, I mean, I just, I don't know about you guys or and even you, Sadie, but like, I can't even imagine just imagining an insect in general feeding on a fish is something that is not computing in my head at the moment. <laughs> just even that. And I've heard of toe biters before, but still just, I mean, I know that it yeah, happens, but I just there, don't. There's, a, there's a, aquatic <laughs> beetles that are also predatory. There's lots of dragonfly nymphs. Uh, a oh, lot yeah, of those are really cool. Or, you know, yeah. that's the one thing, you know, you get really amazed by the biology. So if you've ever... You know, I say, I would tell people, go Google YouTube, look for a video of a dragon, 
uh, flying nymph feeding. And they have these amazing protrusible jaws that look straight out of aliens that they can shoot out this kind of modified lip mouth structure and grasp um, an elusive prey at them like a small fish or a tadpole. Um, so, you know, kind of nightmare fuel, but I'm fascinated by it. And, you know, we're going to have one day um, next Tuesday, I believe, is our water bugs day. So we're having a whole mm -hmm. day or a whole section rather dedicated to aquatic macroinvertebrates and right. dragonfly nymphs are going to feature. Right, so hang out for mm -hmm. that one. Um, we have another one that's asking, um, had, one of my neighbors has two bug zappers in their yard. Do these things have any redeeming features? <laughs> I guess redeeming is kind of, it's kind of a subjective, I guess if you're trying to kill bugs, I guess they do have redeeming. I mean, they're very um, non-selective. You know, one of the interesting things of which we'll actually touch on in one of our uh, videos later on about uh, black lighting for bugs is, and, you, and most people have the observation that um, insects are drawn to light. And what they're really drawn to is not that it's the ultraviolet part of the visible or, or the ultraviolet spectrum of light. So it's kind of not really in the, our visible field. And uh, for whatever reason, it's thought um, insects maybe use this um, to navigate. Um, there is UV radiation that reflects off the moon. So often the moon is sometimes used as kind of a navigation signal for nocturnal insects. But if you put out an artificial light, uh, particularly one that puts out a lot of UV, it will attract insects. And the way those things work is they attract the bugs with the light the bugs get close enough and often they come in contact with some kind of metallic screen, which then zaps them to death. So, you know, all that popping sound, you might get a mosquito here and there, but in most cases they're killing other um, insects, which are not going to harm you at all. So they're more for kind of show and for people like, I don't know, that think they're killing mosquitoes. Um, it's, it's hard to selectively kill mosquitoes. So I don't generally recommend them. I like attracting bugs to observe them. Um, I'm not crazy about mosquitoes, but they're a small price to pay for observing a lot of other cool bugs. Yeah. Now we, you, can uh, make your own, you can make your own bug attractive without the zapper, which is what we're going to talk about uh, in one of our little streams later in the week. I was, I was saying, at Expedition, the only time we ever use bug zappers is for horse flies because horse flies find us delicious. <laughs> and sometimes it can yeah. be difficult to be delicious all the time. <laughs> hey. Um Someone asked this really great question, I think. I've never seen pill bugs around anymore. Are pill bugs or roly polies related to millipedes? Um, okay. I don't know if you saw my earlier talk. So, what we call pill bugs and roly polies are actually terrestrial isopods. So, they are in the, in the um, group crustacea, they're actually terrestrial crustaceans. Um, and they're incredibly common. Most of the ones we see here, are actually introduced species. Uh, we get the roly polies we see here are actually from Europe and they've been established in the US and occur throughout the US. Uh, we have some ones that don't roll up but they're called sow bugs. And along the coast, there are some things they call sea slaters, which are related to these. But they're all, they're basically um, terrestrial crustaceans. Um, and I, can you, Ali, one more time, I did, the question was about were they, um, oh, related to mill pigs. So a really good question is, um, and I didn't point on this, you know, most people when they think of millipedes think of something elongate, but maybe what you're getting at is we actually have, and there are within millipedes, there are millipedes that actually mimic roly polies and they're short stubby little millipedes. Um, in other parts of the world, they're quite big. There are some in Madagascar that are like the size of golf balls. We actually have them here in Alabama and they're really tiny. We actually have two genera and I think three species and they're on my wish list. I haven't found them yet. I bet we have them all throughout the state. Um, people have told me they found them in Birmingham, up in Huntsville. Um, they live in kind of rotten vegetation, rotten logs. And the problem is you have to look for them. They look like small roly polies. So um, there are, in fact, they're not related, but we do have millipedes that kind of mimic roly polies. And again, it's a defensive mechanism. There's actually some beetles that can actually roll up as well. And I'll have to find an image somewhere, but there are some striking examples of convergent evolution where millipedes, beetles and millipedes have all devolved this kind of armadillo-like defense. I mean, there's even some armadillos that roll up. They, and, it, and what they do is they just curl up. They use their armor and they stick their soft bits inside uh, to protect themselves. There's actually a, a spider. I may actually, maybe I'll add this to my spider presentation called a woodlouse hunter. Again, it's an introduced species that specifically hunts and feeds on roly polies and their relatives. 
and it has these it has enormous fangs it look it looks super scary when people see it, but it's they're not going to hurt you they're just looking for millipedes but they've had an arms race with with excuse me with roly polies and now have developed these massive fangs that they can actually get through the roly polies armor so the neat thing about bugs is you know because they've been around so long um Bugs have been preying on other bugs. There's some amazing cat and mouse games they developed. Defenses, counter defenses. Um, so if you're really getting to bugs, there's just so much fascinating biology that goes along with them. A great question. That's a great. Uh, the same person that said that they wanted to see it said that they, if I find one, she'll bring it to you. <laughs> okay. Right. Yeah, I mean, um, I, didn't, I find things in my backyard, and I, that that's literally there are a few bugs I really want to see. I haven't seen. Um, the dismal lights, the glowing uh, I want to see those. We have those in Alabama. Um, but the pill millipedes, I, I, you know, I know they're here based on scientific literature. And I've talked to one person who's actually said he's found them. Uh, but part of me is I just have to spend the time out in the woods flipping over logs. Maybe you'll find some. So I think what you have to do is collect a lot of roly polies, particularly small ones, and look at them carefully under a microscope. Because when you look under the microscope, um, Look at details like the number of legs per segment. You'll suddenly realize there's only one pair of legs per segment um, in true roly polies, where there'll be two in the millipedes. Um, Sadie, have you ever seen the dismalites? Have you ever done that dismal's canyon thing? I have not. I, know, I really want to see those. Too. <laughs> yeah, they, I have heard really great things. I've never done that either. So maybe one day we can all do a Bama Bug Fest trip out to the dismal. Oh, do a museum dismal trip. Canyon. Yeah, exactly. Um, all right. So I think we've answered all of our questions that we have today. If anything else pops up, we'll make sure to answer them as quickly as possible, um, send them to the experts and get answers from them. Uh, I do want to talk about what's happening on our next day of Bama Bug Fest, which is Thursday. So I'm going to share my screen here real quick. Um, mm -hmm, hang on. There it is. Oh, wait, no, that's not it. Oh my gosh, I'm sorry everybody, what's happening? Okay, so uh, let me see, is my screen showing? I am not doing well at this. Okay, so um, it's live, it's live. <laughs> there it is. There it is, can you guys see it? Yep. Okay, so Thursday, um, is our next day, Thursday, July 9th. Two more days. You only have to wait two more days for more bug inf and bug Ooh. stuff. Um, we will have uh, content again at 10, 2, 4, and 7, just like on every day. We will start with Learn to Draw Spider-Man with DC Comics artist Sarah Lever, which we're really excited about. She is a co an artist who has drawn for DC Comics, and she will... Um, host or lead a an art lesson to teach you how to dress spider-man i know dc marvel we're getting everybody in there um this is an art lesson that's suitable for all experience levels so if you're just starting out or if you started out a little while ago and you've gotten some skill all of those art levels are um artistic levels are um, able to watch this and, and have fun and, and draw spider-man now once you finish your spider-man drawing we would love it if you would be willing to share it online with the hashtag Bama Bug Fest um, so that we can kind of see what you guys have done with the art contest or with the, uh, sorry, with the uh, Spider-Man drawings. And then our next one is the first of uh, two others that'll be like this, but it's called a comic book expert, a scientist and Spider-Man walked into a live stream. So we will have um, a comic book um, expert, the um, um, the manager and the and the owner of the comic strip in Tuscaloosa, will be here. An arachnologist, Dr. Sebastian Echiaveri, will be coming, and then Spider Man will join us as well for a conversation about how spiders and comics come together, which I think is great. Um, and then after that, you'll see Dr. Freel again doing um, eight legged facts about spiders, and he'll have some really great um, interesting facts about spiders on that one, and. Uh, directly following that will be Spiderly Speaking with our own Dr. Ruth, who will talk a little bit about how spiders um, make other spiders and some really interesting facts about that whole process. And then at seven, again, will be our daily wrap up, similar to today, where we'll be collecting questions and asking the experts questions and um, taking questions live. So 
this is Thursday, July 9th. We hope that you can join in for us. And again, remember, if you're not able to watch them while they are happening, you're always welcome to go back and watch them. Um, they're archived on YouTube channels and the Facebook pages. Um, and so please make sure to check those out. Um, but I think, is there anything else that we need to, before I do my little thing, is there anything else anyone wants to leave? Um, any final parting thoughts? No, I think we, this is good yeah. for initial one. Like I said, Great. send the questions in. Uh, we're more than happy. Um, I, I love researching. I love being challenged. I mean, I'm not, you know, I tell people I, I play a bug expert on live streams. I mean, my, my professional training is in fishes, um, but I've been fascinated with um, bugs, particularly since moving to Alabama. So it's been kind of me. I'm like a kid and, and you know, much like uh, a lot of, I think almost all kids love bugs and we kind of lose that enthusiasm as we get older we get distracted by other things and i think our society just kind of unfortunately squashes our interest in bugs um so i hope hopefully our activities um will rekindle that fascination with it because uh, we really are whether we uh, want to admit or not our our lives and our livelihoods are so interconnected uh with arthropods and this is just a great opportunity to you know make that reconnection excellent um well, thank you all again for joining us for Bama Bug Fest on the web. Make sure to check us out on Thursday, July 9th for our Into the Spider-Verse Day. Uh, content always appears at 10, 2, 4, and 7, and always on Central Standard Time. If you aren't able to join us for the live presentations at the times that they happen, you can always go back and watch them later through archived videos on our social media sites, YouTube channels, and with our handy resource guide, which you can find at bamabugfest.org. Um, there you can also find a link to our art contest, which you can enter um, if you find any inspiration in all this buggy talk that we've been having and will be having over the next couple of weeks um, and find some inspiration. Um, you can enter in an art, a piece of art that will be part of a contest that we have. Um, we also will have a virtual exhibit that you're welcome to um, get a chance to uh, peruse and get to see and learn a little bit more about um, insect photography uh, done by some UA students, which is really exciting. Um, and all of those are available at bamabugfest.org. Um, as we want to the UA Museums, um, the Warner Transportation Museum, the Alabama Museum of Natural History, the Department of Research and Collections, UA's Rogers Library, and the Tuscaloosa Public Library for all of your work in organizing this event. And thank you to Sadie and John for being here today. We appreciate you sharing to your time and expertise with us um, for Bama Bug Fest. So thank you all, and I hope you have a good night, and we will see you all on Thursday. Hi, Bye, folks. Bye. <laughs> Bye.